Okay, so if we again start with a summary of our last lecture. Um, first, I showed you a simple problem, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and in that problem, uh, that problem was a very simple problem that shows how these are dynamic coefficients are used. That was, I think, a nice problem. And um, I suggest that you study the problem. There are additional uh, parts of this problem which I didn't talk about in the class, but especially before the second midterm, you should definitely take a look at these other parts and you should uh, solve them. Okay, and then on Friday, I talked about standard atmosphere. So what standard atmosphere is and how that is obtained and how we use it. So that was the the main topic of the Friday's lecture. Um, so this is about how the standard atmosphere tables are created. And this is just good for you to know as general information. But other than that, um, to use this, um, you'll be referring to such tables, okay? In the exams, I will be providing these tables. And other than the exams, if you want to study performance of an aircraft, you can refer to these tables to find uh, the density at the altitude where your aircraft is flying. And if you want to compute the Mach number and the Reynolds number, then you'll be using these numbers as well. Okay, so that's what we said on Friday. Uh, so today, I would like to start talking about uh, aircraft performance calculations. Okay, so this is the first lecture that we are actually starting uh, the performance calculations. Um, so let me insert a new page here. Uh, so, so far, we talked about these four forces of flight, right? Um, so anyway, we said that um, for an aircraft, there's the lift force and the drag force. There's also the weight of the aircraft and, and the engine provides thrust force. And in, uh, in a flight in equilibrium, that means where the altitude and the speed of the aircraft doesn't change. These all forces should be in balance. That's what we said earlier. So today let's start um, taking a more scientific look at this problem. Okay, so as an engineer. So this equilibrium flight is a very important flight condition and uh, we do a lot of calculations based on uh, this force diagram. Uh, but let's start with a more general uh, case of this motion. Okay, um, so let's talk about this force and moment acting on aircraft in longitudinal motion. So again, this is the the more general case of uh, this longi longitudinal flight. Okay, so let me just start by reading from here. The general motion of an aircraft in three-dimensional space consists of translation along three axes and rotation around three axes, making a total of six degrees of freedom. Analysis of six degrees of freedom motion mathematically is a complex problem. The problem is simplified a lot if you restrict the motion to one plane only. For this purpose, we start with the analysis of longitudinal flight, where the motion is restricted to the vertical plane only. Uh, so we talked about longitudinal flight earlier. In this case, the aircraft is allowed to translate along x and z axis. And this is the, the x axis, or let's use this um, picture. So this is the x axis, this is z axis. So these two axes together define a plane, uh, a vertical plane. And uh, we assume that the aircraft can move within that plane only. So it doesn't have a three dimensional uh, flight in this case. And it's also allowed to rotate around the y-axis, uh, which is called the pitching motion. Therefore, longitudinal flight is a three degree of freedom motion. It, uh, so it has three degrees of freedom. These are the translation along x-axis, translation along z-axis, and rotation around y-axis. Um, so since the motion is in the vertical plane only, so we can uh, show all the forces and moments on a two-dimensional view here that you see here. 
Okay, so since we are looking at the more the most general case here, so let's assume that the aircraft is flying with some uh, angles. Uh, so this this red line you see here uh, shows the flight path. That means the aircraft is uh, moving along this path. Okay, so it's uh, climbing actually. This is called the flight path, and the angle it makes with the horizontal is gamma. This is known as the flight path angle. And if it is flying with an uh, angle of attack, then the angle of attack will be the angle between um, the chord line of the, the wing and uh, velocity vector. The velocity vector will be parallel to the flight path, right? Since the aircraft is moving along this line, its velocity vector will be parallel to that. So the V infinity vector is actually in the same uh, direction as the flight path. So in this case, the angle of attack becomes this angle here, alpha. And the orientation of the aircraft with respect to the Earth is um, described with its pitch angle. Uh, so this axis is the axis of the aircraft, the longitudinal axis of the aircraft, x-axis. And the angle between the x-axis and the horizontal is the pitch angle, which is the theta angle here. Uh, so here in this diagram we are making already uh, we already started making assumptions and the assumption is that the x-axis is parallel to the chord line, which shouldn't which doesn't have to be the case always. So if you refer here, normally there can be a small angle between the chord line and the x-axis of the airplane. So the blue line here is the x-axis. So this is the x-axis. And the chord line is the red line. Uh, so, while manufacturing the aircraft, the wing is mounted with some incidence angle, okay? Uh, due to several reasons. We can talk about this later, but in general, there may be an angle between the two, and this angle is called the incidence angle, or the angle of incidence. Uh, so, in, the, in this diagram, we're assuming that that angle is zero, okay? So otherwise, if that angle was not zero, then there would have to be a, an additional line here showing the chord line. So for example, this could be the chord line, and then that would complicate the things. So this is just a simplifying assumption that uh, we assume that the incidence angle is zero, uh, which is not a bad assumption, because the incidence angle, even if it's not zero, it should be, it will be a small angle on the order of just a few degrees, two degrees, three degrees, something like that. And uh, such a, for such a small angle, uh, we can approximate the cosine of a small angle as one, and the sine of the angle as uh, the angle itself, which is a small number. So anyway, so that's the first assumption we make here. Okay. And since the flight path is this red one, uh, the aerodynamic force component along that direction is our drag force, right? So the drag force is shown here, and it is uh, parallel to the flight path. And the lift force is, again, by definition, perpendicular to that. So this is our lift force here. And the weight of the aircraft is pointing towards the center of the Earth. So this is always perpendicular to the ground. And there's a thrust force, and again, we assume that the thrust force is along the x-axis of the aircraft, which again doesn't have to be the case. So if uh, there may be a small angle between uh, the engine axis and the axis of the aircraft, but again, we assume that that angle is also zero. And if you just look at the geometry here, you will see that uh, the angle between um, the weight vector of the aircraft and the lift force is equal to the flight path angle, gamma. Okay? Um, so this is the more general case than simply uh, this case, right? So there are some additional angles involved. Okay, so let's study this, uh, these forces. Since there are two degrees of freedom, uh, we can write the Newton's second law of motion, which is F is equal to ma, twice. Once 
for uh, one of the axes and second time for the other axis. So let's take a look at that on the next slide. Uh, so what I do is I choose two of two axes as uh, one as parallel to the flight path and the other as perpendicular to flight path. And I just collect all the forces. Okay? So these are the forces that are parallel to the flight path. Okay, so I have the thrust force and the component along the flight path is thrust force times the cosine of this angle which is what I have here and the entire drag force is in the flight path direction so I just subtract it from that so I don't multiply this with any uh, sine or cosine term next the weight of the aircraft has a little component in the flight path right due to this gum angle so I the W vector is multiplied with sine of this angle and it's in the same direction as the drag force so that has a negative sign here so these are all the forces since the lift force is perpendicular to the flat path it doesn't have any component in this uh, case so the lift force is not uh, included in the uh, force summation and if everything is in equilibrium, then the not sum of these forces should be zero. But in the most general case, there can be an acceleration. And uh, so what I do in this case, I add all these forces and I equate that to mass times acceleration, whereas the acceleration is the change of uh, flight speed. Okay, so this is the first equation I have for the um, for my first axis. The second axis is the axis perpendicular to that. So I do something similar. I collect all the forces along that direction. And these forces are, the lift force itself is entirely in this direction. Uh, the majority of the weight vector is in the same direction. And then thrust has a little component in that uh, direction. So these are the forces, which are written here as you see. And uh, Again, there can be an acceleration in the vertical plane, vertical axis as well. And I describe that acceleration as this. So let me talk about this a little bit. Uh, so this is my aircraft. So let me clear this picture a little bit. So I talked about two axes, right? One is parallel to the flight path, the other is perpendicular. So the, the force along this direction uh, changed the magnitude of the velocity directly. So that's dv by dt. And the acceleration in the, the perpendicular axis is this one. So there is an acceleration here. Let me call this a um, n for normal, normal acceleration. So what this normal acceleration will do is it will uh, cause the velocity vector to change direction, right? So this is my velocity vector. And due to this acceleration term, uh, the velocity vector will be bent, right? It will be rotated. So what this effectively does is um, this vertical acceleration causes the, the flight path to uh, change direction. So uh, if there was no vertical acceleration, this would be the flight path. But since now I have this vertical acceleration, the flight path will be uh, rotated like that. Okay? Um, so in other words, the aircraft will be rotating around an imaginary point. So which would be somewhere up there. So let me so let me move everything to the next slide. So somewhere around here let's say uh, the flat path will be a circle around this imaginary um, center of rotation, 
Okay, so this let me call this R sub C. And the aircraft is making a circular motion around this point. Okay? And in this case, uh, this acceleration which I called AM here will be equal to V squared divided by RC. Right? Hopefully you remember this from your physics courses. Okay? So an object moving around a circle going around the circle experiences a, um, an acceleration uh, a centrifugal acceleration and that acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration will be given by V squared divided by RC so this is the V infinite vector okay so now these are the two general equations of motion for the longitudinal flight for the most general longitudinal flight so this is the first uh, equation and this is the second equation <coughs> okay so these are the two equations of motion for the for general longitudinal flight okay so now we obtained the general equations uh, for the longitudinal flight. Now, let's take a look at a simplified or a special case of this longitudinal flight. We simplify the problem further by considering a steady flight at constant speed at constant altitude. Um, since the altitude doesn't change, the flight path is horizontal, so gamma should be zero. So this is the uh, steady level flight condition. So we go from the more uh, the most general flight longitudinal flight to a special case of this flight where uh, the accelerations are zero. Okay, so there's no change in the velocity. So the right hand side of this equation is zero. There's no change in altitude. That means the flight path should remain horizontal and there should be no vertical acceleration. This term is zero. And since uh, the altitude doesn't change, the flight should be uh, parallel the flight path should be parallel and that means the gamma angle should be zero okay so this is the, uh, the a special case of the longitudinal flight maybe I should add this as a list um, so this special case is called the steady, <coughs> steady level flight condition and by steady we mean that the flight variables are uh, constant. There is no change in flight variables, which are uh, the flight speed and angle of attack. And level means flight path is horizontal. Okay, so this is the steady level flight. Let me make this. Okay, so for this special flight case, if you uh, apply the simplification due to these assumptions into the general equations so let's take a look at what we uh, get Uh, since it's a steady flight condition, the derivative term should be zero. So this equals to square zero because it's a steady flight. And this is also equal to zero because it's a level flight. The, the altitude doesn't change. And the sine gamma is equal to zero because it's a level flight. Cosine gamma becomes equal to one. Um, 
We also make an additional assumption that the angle of attack is a small angle. We also make an assumption that angle of attack is Okay, in this case, so this is equal to 1, and this term just drops completely. And we are left with uh, these equations that we, uh, we saw before, actually. So these are the new equations for this special flight case. Then we have trust is equal to drag and lift is equal to weight. Okay? Um, let's see. Okay, so these equations, I'm talking about these two simple equations, are valid for the simplest flight you can ever have. So there's nothing difficult here. No accelerations. Accelerations are obviously hard to analyze because due to this acceleration, for one thing, the equation becomes a differential equation, right? If there's no acceleration, then you have a simple algebraic equation. But if there's an acceleration, then you have a differential equation. And obviously, differential equations are more difficult to uh, solve. And uh, so, therefore, this is the simplest flight you can ever imagine. But perhaps it is the most important flight phase. So it is the simplest, but luckily it is the most important flight phase, and that's because a big part of most of the flights take place at steady level flights, at constant speed and altitude. So, for example, imagine uh, consider the um, commercial flights between cities. For example, if you if you are traveling from Istanbul to uh, New York, for example, then the aircraft takes off, reaches a certain altitude and then starts going uh, along a straight flight path, right? So if the flight is, uh, takes 9 or 10 hours, then more than 90% of the flight uh, obeys the assumptions that lead to these simplified equations, okay? So do, because of that, since even though this is the simplest flight phase, it is perhaps the most important flight phase because most of the, uh, the fuel consumption, for example, will take place under these conditions. Okay? Okay, let's see. Let's see what we can say about this. So anyway, you can read through this later on. Let me just skip that. Okay, so let's take a look at these equations. This is the first equation. And instead of the drag force, I use my aerodynamic drag equation, which is this one here. And the second equation is weight is equal to the lift. And for the lift force, I use this equation. Okay? But what I do here is, I know that the drag coefficient and lift coefficient are not independent. Uh, so remember the drag polar relation. So instead of the drag coefficient, I can write it as a summation of two drag coefficients, uh, the preside drag coefficients and the induced drag coefficients. And instead of the induced drag coefficient, I can use this expression. So this was my drag polar equation. And this drag polar equation combines these two equations. Okay? Uh, so I have this force balance in the state level flight condition and these forces are not independent of each other due to this equation connecting the lift and drag equations. Okay? So I will be using these three equations while studying the state level flight uh, condition. So let's continue. So to maintain a state level flight at a given speed uh, v infinity, 
Lift coefficient has to have a specific value that can be found from this equation. Uh, so in state level flight, this equation should uh, be satisfied. So from this equation, I can find out what should the lift coefficient be. Okay. Uh, so if I want the lift force to be equal to the weight of the aircraft, then the lift coefficient should have this specific value, which is, I, I just basically um, use this equation to find the CL expression. Um, Okay, now before proceeding further, let's take a look at a very simple example. Let's consider a Boeing 747 aircraft in steady level flight at a certain altitude where the row is 0 0.8 kilograms to, uh, over uh, cubic meters. So let's see what the altitude sh should be approximately. Let me refer to the previous table here. It was 0 0.8, right? Let's see, and 0 0.8 is a little bit uh, higher than this altitude, right? So it should be a little over 4 kilometers, the altitude of the aircraft is. Anyway, and um, the mass of the aircraft is given as 400,000 kilograms. And the wing surface area is given as 525 uh, square meters. And we are given this data for the lift coefficient. Uh, this is the CL alpha curve of the Boeing 747 aircraft. Uh, this is the plane wing configuration. So this is the plane airfoil. And Boeing 747 has flaps and slats. If the flaps are used, uh, the lift coefficient is increased. Uh, so the maximum lift coefficient increases from 1.5 to 2.4. So the green curve represents the case where the, the flaps are um, deployed. And if you use the slats as well, then you get a further increase in the lift coefficient. And the, con the lift curve for this case where both flaps and slats are used is this red one. And the lift coefficient reaches a maximum of 3.3. .3. Okay? Uh, so let's see. Let's find the minimum speed at which the Boeing 747 can maintain a steady level flight with a clean wing. Uh, so that means the sl slats slat and flaps are both not used with a clean wing. The, uh, the minimum flight speed that can be achieved is asked. So we uh, use this equation. Uh, we know that the weight should be, uh, the lift should be equal to the weight, which is given as 400,000 kilograms uh, times the gravitational acceleration. Uh, so from this equation, <coughs> since we are asked to find the value of the speed of the aircraft, then I solve for V, and this is what I obtain. Okay? So the velocity should be equal to this. And as you see, the velocity depends on the lift coefficient value, okay? Uh, so the speed of the flight will be depending on lift coefficient. And since we are asked to find the minimum possible flight speed, this will be at, obtained at the maximum possible lift coefficient. And the maximum lift coefficient for the cleaning configuration is 1.5. And if you use 1.5 into this equation, you find the minimum flight speed as 111.6 meters per square and the question also asks us to find the minimum speed for the half flap and full flap configurations for the half flap I'm re referring to this case so if you extend the flaps only the lift coefficient increases to 2.4 so you go to this equation and instead of 1.5 you use 2.4 in that equation and that gives you a smaller uh, speed value which is 88.2 meters per second. Okay, so if the pilot uh, extends the flaps then he can fly the aircraft slower and this is that slower speed. And in the, the full flap case where both slats and flaps are used this value increases, the lift coefficient value increases to 3.3 .3, uh, 
and the corresponding speed for that case turns out to be 75.2 meters per second. Okay? Bir bölüm sessizliği var sınıfta değil mi? Okay, do you have any questions? So, I would like to talk a little bit about this problem. Okay, so we said that to be able to fly at this speed, a Boeing 747 has to uh, have the both slats and flaps extended fully. And let's think about what happens if um, the, the flight speed is lower than that. So this is the minimum possible flight, uh, minimum possible uh, speed. Let's say for some reason the aircraft slows down even more. Let's say the engines are uh, not running properly and the aircraft cannot maintain this speed. So if the speed gets lower than this, then the lift force will be less, right? So this is our lift equation. So the lift coefficient is at its maximum value. And if this is less than 75.2, then, then lift will be less than the weight of the aircraft and the aircraft will start uh, losing altitude, right? Because the vertical uh, acceleration, the vertical um, force balance is not satisfied anymore and the aircraft will start losing altitude. It cannot maintain a steady level flight anymore. Uh, okay, so at that point, at the lowest possible flight, we're flying at this condition, right? The angle of attack should be equal to the value that gives the maximum lift uh, coefficient. And if the angle of attack gets any lower or any higher, then uh, the lift coefficient will be reduced. And this is the stall condition. Uh, so I would like to show you some videos regarding this stall, aerodynamic stall. Let me... So this is a nice video explaining the stall with some uh, wind tunnel tests. So he's referring to this angle here. The, an airfoil always falls at a, the same angle of attack, regardless of uh, everything else. Okay, so if for this aircraft, for example, if this is correct, and uh, you will know that if your angle reaches this value, then you will have stall. And if the angle exceeds this angle, if you pass to the right side of this uh, point, then you will, the coefficient will start going down. And as you see in the video, and as I explained earlier, um, uh, 
the flow over the airfoil will be uh, will not be uniform, will not be steady. There will be uh, separation, and this, the, due to separation, there will be turbulence, and the flow will be uh, um, uh, the forces will be oscillating. Right? You will not have a steady, constant force, but you will have a varying force. Okay, so let me show you my second uh, video. So in this video, just to demonstrate stall, they edit these little strips over the wing, and by just looking at the wings, you can uh, see when the uh, stall occurs. Okay, so you can actually tell if when the angle of attack increases. So this is the ground. You see, let's, if you use this line as a reference, and your chord line is something like this, so the angle of attack is uh, can be uh, seen here. And as you see, the in a few seconds, the angle of attack will be increased. So at this point, the angle of attack is quite high. So if you pay attention to the, the orientation of the wing, you can say that the angle of attack is now really high, and you can see from these strips that uh, the wing has stalled. Uh, so, I can give you an additional information here. Most of the wings are designed in such a way that uh, the root section stalls first. Uh, when stall starts to happen, uh, this part of the wing stalls before the tip section stalls. And the reason for that is you want the aircraft to be controllable when it stalls. Okay, so if for some reason your aircraft stalls, you want to be able to get out of the stall condition. And uh, since you have the ailerons close to the tip of the wing, uh, even when the, the center section stalls, if, you have, if the tip section hasn't stalled yet, you can use the ailerons to control the aircraft, to roll it if necessary, right? And if you look at the video here, you can see that the aileron moving, right? It's, it's hard to see, but if, if you pay attention, you can see that the, this section has not stalled yet. The strips here are still smooth. Okay, so this stall is a very important uh, phenomenon and obviously you have to be very careful about that because once your aircraft stalls then uh, if there's nothing wrong, most aircraft can get out of the stall condition easily, but obviously in certain cases you can have serious accidents. Okay? Any questions? Uh, let's give a break now and then continue after the break.